This video is brought to you by Magellan TV. Discover a new type of documentary film experience with Magellan TV and its binge-worthy documentaries updated every week. More on them in just a bit. With Russia as the world's top exporter of natural gas, around 60% more than second place Qatar, and Germany as the second highest importer, a mere whisker behind Japan, a direct pipeline over the shortest distance between the two would seem like a bit of a no-brainer. Overland routes involve transit fees for the countries en route, but if you built the pipeline under the Baltic, well, that would be pretty good. The first undersea pipeline, codenamed Pluto, underwater transportation of oil, or as civilians interpreted at a pipeline under the ocean, was laid by the HMS Latimer in just 10 hours on August 12, 1944. The pipeline failed when an escorting destroyer caught it with its anchor and damaged it beyond repair. The second line was laid by the HMS Sancroft two days later. The distance was not great, from Sandown on the Isle of Wight to the French coast, but in a maritime war zone, this was a considerable technical achievement. The problems that had to be overcome to run a 1,222-kilometer pipeline under the Baltic were both technological as well as political. The sheer length of the Nord Stream pipeline was the first snag to overcome. While overland pipelines had booster compressors along the way to maintain pressure in the pipeline, undersea pipes had to manage without. At the time, the longest undersea pipeline in the world was the Langelet from Norway to England, but even that had an en route connection via the Sleipner Riser platform in the North Sea. Nord Stream didn't have that option. The 220 bar pressure generated the Portavaya compressor had to propel the gas for the entire 1,222 kilometer distance, and the pipe would have to be constructed to take that high initial pressure. But a pipe of such stringent specifications was not necessary further down the pipeline where the pressure decreased, and the designers came up with a cost saving plan that took that into consideration. The pipeline had a constant internal diameter of 1,153 millimeters. But the system was designed to have three different pressure sections 220, 200, and 177.5 bar, with a pipe wall thickness of 34.4, 30.9, and 26.8 millimeters corresponding to the pressure drop over the length of the journey. The original pipeline project started in 1997 when Gazprom, a Russian majority state owned multinational energy corporation headquartered in St. Petersburg, and its associates formed the joint company North Transgas, later renamed Nord Stream AG, for construction and operation of a gas pipeline from Russia to Germany across the Baltic Sea. A route survey in the economic zones of Finland, Sweden, Denmark, and Germany and a feasibility study of the pipeline were conducted in 1998. Several routes were considered, including routes with onshore segments through Finland and Sweden. The Nord Stream scheme included two double pipelines, the original Nord Stream running from Viborg to Lubnin near Greifswald, and two further pipelines, Nord Stream 2 running from Ustluga to Lubnin. The environmental impact assessment was conducted from 2006 to 2009 in Russia, Finland, Sweden, Denmark, and Germany, as well as Poland, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia as affected parties. The greatest impact, the report concluded, would be from the consumption of the transported gas. At an annual output of 55 billion cubic meters, each pair of pipes could cause emissions of 110 million tons of CO2 per year at a time when Europe was striving to reduce its carbon footprints. Further, the compressor station at the Russian beginning of the Nord Stream 1 was projected to emit around 1.5 million tons of CO2 annually. Taking into account that the production of steel for the pipes, not to mention the concrete and other materials, would add millions of tons of CO2 to the atmosphere, it's not surprising that the pipeline projects were criticized by some countries and environmental organizations. Carbon dioxide wasn't the only cause for concern. There was a fear that the pipeline could disturb World War II graves dating from naval battles in 1941. While the route avoided one known wreck, a seismic vessel discovered a sunken Soviet submarine in the Gulf of Finland. Other wrecks in the area were much older, dating back, according to Russian archaeologists, to the reign of Peter the Great, who ruled Russia from 1682 to 1725. The Baltic Sea was heavily mined during World Wars I and II. With many mines still in the sea, it was feared that the pipeline would disturb them. 
Sunken mines were found on the pipeline route, primarily in international waters at a depth of more than 70 meters, and they were simply detonated underwater. There was also worry that the construction would bring up ammunition and other toxic materials dumped in the sea, particularly during World War II, and that these toxic substances could damage the Baltic's sensitive ecosystem. Swedish environmentalists called for an examination of the possibility of rerouting the pipeline onto dry land. Finnish environmentalist groups also claimed that the flatter seabed to the south of the proposed route would make construction more more straightforward and therefore less disruptive, while Latvia worried that the lack of water circulation in the Baltic Sea made Nord Stream hazardous, and Estonia warned the pipeline could alter undersea currents. The Worldwide Fund for Nature requested protection for the Baltic marine habitats, which could be upset by the project, and its Finnish branch threatened legal action. Russian environmental organizations warned of possible damage to planned nature preserves, and Swedish environmentalist groups worried that the pipeline would pass too closely to the border of the marine reserve near Gotland. Greenpeace was naturally concerned about a lot of sensitive areas. Considering all of this, permits were a very long time coming, and it took very, very long for Nord Stream to get the go-ahead from all of the authorities along the route. The Swedish government initially rejected the application, and new paperwork had to be submitted. Denmark gave permission for the pipeline to pass through its waters in October 2009, and the following month, Swedish and Finnish governments also allowed the pipeline to pass through their territory. This was despite the fact that Nord Stream had hired former Finnish Prime Minister Paavo Lipponen as a consultant to help speed up the application process in Finland, because of course they did. The final environmental permit was issued in February 2010. The project was also controversial from a political and economic standpoint. Ukraine in particular, but also Poland and other Central and Eastern European countries, objected to missing out on the lucrative transit fees because the pipeline previously went through their countries. The United States weighed in because of concerns that the pipeline would increase Russia's control of gas supplies in Europe. How pertinent. However, construction of the first stage of the project, the Russian onshore feeding pipeline for Nord Stream, had already got underway in December 2005, and the pipeline and the operating company were officially renamed Nord Stream AG in 2006, with the first stage being completed in 2010. Meanwhile, the Italian company, Snab Progressi, had been appointed design engineers for the pipeline in 2007, and its parent company, Saipem, awarded the construction contract in 2008, by which time all supply contracts were also in place. Rolls-Royce was awarded a contract to supply turbines for the compressor and the seabed dredging contract was put in place in January 2009. Now we'll get back to today's video in just a moment, but first, here's a quick word from today's sponsor, Magellan TV. Magellan TV is an amazing documentary streaming service founded by filmmakers for the love of history. And with more than 3,000 excellent programs available on Magellan, it's hard to stop watching once you start. They've got everything from the Greeks, the Great War, plus modern history, biographies, scientific profiles, true crime, and so much more. And their team adds more content every single week. And what's one thing you love about paid streaming services? There are no ads, just a lot of content. Now, if you're still working through some of that leftover Halloween spirit, you might want to check out Magellan's Ultimate Halloween Playlist. Or, if you're American who's ready to move on to Thanksgiving, that holiday that none of the rest of us really understands, then maybe check out The Pilgrim's Journey into the Unknown. Great fall holiday options there. This holiday season, you guys can take advantage of a special deal with Magellan by clicking on the link in the description below. You can snag a buy one, get one free deal for an annual membership. That way, you can give the gift of Magellan and still keep a little something extra for yourself. It's content for days and days, so let Magellan hook you and a friend up. You'll be glad that you did. And now back to today's video. Construction of the Port of Aya compressor station in Viborg began in January 2010. The first part of the pipeline was laid in Swedish territory in April 2010, and the construction of the pipeline was officially launched on the 9th of April 2010 at Port of Aya Bay. This was the moment when multiple pieces of the project started to come together. The construction and logistics problems included, among other things, having pipes manufactured, concrete coated, and in the right place at the right time to keep the construction machine running seamlessly. For 30 months. Construction of the pipelines was scheduled to minimize environmental impact, for example, not to interfere with critical seal breeding and fish spawning seasons. Each line is made up of about 100,000 pipes to be laid in three sections, with different wall thickness following the direction of the gas flow. Along the pipeline route, five harbor sites supplied concrete coated pipes on a continuous basis to the laying barges. Initially, three vessels were used working at different segments of the route. Later in construction, only two vessels were needed. Saipens, Castoro, 
yet sea designed for shallow waters worked in the Bay of Greifswald, laying 28 kilometers of each of the twin pipelines between June and October 2010. All Seas Solitaire, the biggest pipe-laying vessel in the world, laid a 342.5 kilometer section of each of the twin pipelines between September 2010 and August 2011. With its dynamic positioning system, the Solitaire was the ideal vessel for working in the congested Gulf of Finland. Saipem's Castoro Sai laid about 853.5 kilometers of each of the two pipelines, working from April 2010 until the end of the project. In preparation for pipe laying, the seabed had been surveyed with a remotely operated vehicle, ROV, to confirm data gathered when the route was being planned. Some spots were found where the seabed needed loads of coarse gravel to be laid to create a stable base on which the pipeline could rest. On board the pipe laying vessels, the necessary beveling, welding, and testing was carried out before the pipeline was lowered onto the seabed. Once laid, these pipes were again checked to make sure that they were in the correct position. The three pipeline segments were then flooded with water and pressure tested to ensure mechanical integrity before being connected by welding them underwater at the two locations where the wall thickness changes because of the pressure drop. Once connected, the pipeline was emptied of water and filled with nitrogen before natural gas was safely introduced. The last pipe was put in place on the 4th of May 2011, completing the laying of the first line. With all the underwater work finished in June 2011 and a connection made to the Opal Pipeline, which runs along the eastern border of Germany, the first gas was pumped on the 6th of September. 2011. The official inauguration ceremony in Lubmin was attended by German Chancellor Angela Merkel, Russian President Dmitry Medvedev, French Prime Minister François Fillon, and Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rasch on the 8th of November 2011. Construction of the second line was completed in August 2012, and it was inaugurated on the 8th of October 2012. The pipelines had been built, and they were operational, on time, and in budget. A rare statement for a mega projects video. Nord Stream AG had started looking at adding two extra lines, later named Nord Stream 2, as early as 2011, planning to push the annual throughput to 110 billion cubic meters. In January 2015, however, plans were put on temporary hold after the European Union imposed sanctions on Russia following its annexation of Crimea. This has meant that the existing lines were running at only half capacity. In June 2015, the project was revived with Nord Stream 2 AG, a subsidiary of Gazprom, responsible for its development. Germany granted Nord Stream 2 a permit for construction and operation in German waters and for landfall areas near Lubnin in January 2018, and construction started in May, this time at the German end of the route at Greifswald. But all was not plain sailing. The following January, the United States threatened sanctions if work on the project were not stopped. By the end of the year, Nord Stream 2 pipe laying activities had been suspended. The first part of 2020 saw both German and Polish authorities accusing Gazprom of flouting competition rules, thus creating a de facto monopoly. Poland fined Gazprom 50 million euros for not cooperating. Pipe laying eventually resumed in December. The sections were connected in June 2021, and the laying of the second line was completed in September. So, finally, the controversial pipelines were up and running. But this was not the end of the story. Nord Stream Pipeline runs from Viborg Compressor Station in Portofaya Bay via the Baltic to Greifswald in Germany, a distance of 1,222 kilometers. It runs through Russia, Finland, Sweden, Denmark, and finally Germany. Nord Stream 2 starts at the Slavyskaya Compressor Station in Ust-Luger in Russia. The 3.2-kilometer onshore pipeline runs from the compressor station to the landfall on the shore of Narva Bay. Except for the Russian section, the route of Nord Stream 2 follows mainly the route of the Nord Stream, and it has the same capacity. Accepting that the completion of the project was an inevitability, the United States lifted sanctions on the 19th of May 2021. Russian Deputy Foreign Minister Sergei Ryabkov welcomed the move as a chance for a gradual transition toward the normalization of our bilateral ties. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said he was surprised and disappointed by President Joe Biden's decision. Biden made a deal with Germany that they could reimpose sanctions if Russia were to use the pipeline as a political weapon and threaten to cut Russian gas supplies to Poland and the Ukraine. Ukraine. Funds would also be made available for Ukraine's transition to green energy, and Russia would be asked to extend the transit contract. Critics of Nord Stream say that Europe could become dangerously dependent on Russian natural gas and that gas supplies could become a political tool. Spurbank's investment research division in 2018 claimed that the project's goals were exclusively political and corruption-related, stating they are commonly perceived as being foisted on the company by the government pursuing a geopolitical agenda. Swedish military 
experts and several politicians, including former Minister for Defense Mikhail Erdenberg, feared the pipeline might cause a security policy problem for Sweden, being an excuse for a Russian naval presence. Finnish military scholar Alpo Gentunen said that there was clear military implications to the pipeline that were not discussed openly, and when Vladimir Putin stated the ecological safety of the pipeline project would be ensured by using the Baltic fleet of the Russian Navy, even more people got worried, not surprisingly. The Economist magazine warns that Europe was becoming more and more dependent on Russia, while its own gas reserves declined. Some ethical questions have also been raised, and not all have been adequately answered. Vladimir Putin was a strong supporter of the project. The managing director of Nord Stream AG, former East German secret police officer Matthias Warneck, has denied allegations that he knew Putin when he was a KGB agent in East Germany. He said that he had first met Putin when he was attached at the St. Petersburg mayor's office in 1991. German Chancellor Gerhard Schroeder was another strong supporter of the project. The agreement to build the pipeline was signed 10 days before the German parliamentary election. A few weeks before Schroeder stepped down as chancellor, the German government guaranteed to cover 1 billion euros of the Nord Stream project costs should Gazprom default on the loan. The guarantee expired without having been needed. Soon after he stepped down, Schroeder agreed to head the shareholders' committee of Nord Stream AG, an apparent conflict of interest, implying that the pipeline project may have been pushed through for personal gain. No charges have been laid despite years of exhaustive investigations. Also, in February 2009, the Swedish prosecutor's office started an investigation based on suspicions of bribery and corruption after a college professor that had warned that the pipeline could come too close to a sensitive bird zone, and then later the college received a donation from Nord Stream. The consortium has also hired several former high-ranking officials, such as former undersecretary at the Swedish Prime Minister's office and a former press secretary for several politicians in the Swedish Social Democratic Party. In in addition, the former Prime Minister of Finland, Paavo Leponen, had worked for Nord Stream as an advisor since 2008. In spite of all the difficulties and objections, the pipeline is complete. The gas is flowing from Russia to Germany, and most people surveyed seem rather happy with the outcome. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe, and as always, thank you for watching.